between the fiscal year of the Federal Government and the fiscal year of every other jurisdiction in the United States I know has, has created real havoc in some years. Could you speak about that incongruity and what it does to a local jurisdiction to be faced with schools opening yeah. in September before the fiscal year has even begun? Yeah. Uh, let me first comment on your uh, suggestion on the, on the uh, Federal Government you know, uh, closing itself and impact it has on the district government. Uh, my expectation is that we would lose anywhere between one to five million dollars a week, and that is just the tax impact. In the economy, if, if, if we, if you if, had closed down, yes, yes, ma'am. And if uh, we talk about the economic impact, you will top about fifteen million dollars a week. Further, uh, the idea of us deciding on our own. Uh, gives us a flexibility to adjust ourselves. We basically manage our budget based upon the revenue assumptions that were made some 18 months ago. So there is no flexibility when circumstances change, revenues decline, expenditure go up. We don't have a way to adjust ourselves. Next is that in emergency arises, as in case of hospital, when we had to take over the hospital, we had no authority to spend money there. So what we had to do is to borrow money from our contingency funds just to make sure that hospital remains operational, that the emergency care is provided, that doctors are paid, the services are paid. And lastly, on the school issues, because the school year doesn't correspond with the fiscal year, what we have to do every year, we have to give advance money so the school can start planning ahead of time for their academic year, which, which doesn't coincide with the fiscal year. So I think it would be a major improvement of our, manage, our ability to manage budget if we have the budget autonomy. To repeat myself, we are talking about only the local dollars. We are not talking about federal dollars. Mr. Babian. From a bondholder's perspective, um, you know, they certainly value predictability and flexibility in any issuer. So you know, having, having a sense that um, revenues will, will continue to come in and, and that they could be spent um, in, a, in a predictable way is very important. Uh, you know, I think that from, from the idea of the fiscal year shift, uh, you, you know, again, it, it speaks to the exact same issue, and it may also facilitate uh, the districts needing to borrow for, for cash flow uh, mid-year if it, if it does need to do that. Dr. Riblin? Uh, I agree with all of that. Back on the school issue, uh, I believe every state has a June-July uh, fiscal year, and the reason they have chosen that is for this reason, that schools are majorly inconvenienced by starting in August or September and not getting their budgets uh, until uh, the end of September. Could I, can I ask one more question? I was very concerned during the, the shutdown period about possible default or having to somehow redo contracts uh, if some of them came due during the time there, or in between the time, and what uh, those who held these notes would think and whether it would have consequences the next year when you went to get contracts or notes. And I wish you would comment on the effects on possible default or on uh, other contracts and on contracts in the future given the fact that you were close to default this time? Yeah. Uh, I think that, that is a major concern for us. Uh, obviously, our debt service on general obligation bonds, income tax bonds is assured uh, because we put that money in escrow. However, we do borrowing on what is known as certificate of participation, $240 plus million dollars out there, uh, for, uh, which we use to buy police cars, uh, safety equipments, hospitals uh, stuff. On that, we will not be able to pay our debt service because there will be no appropriation for us to be able to pay because Congress was shut down. Uh, and that would cause a, a major havoc in those areas, in public safety, in public health. And as Mr. Fabian pointed out, the bond agencies and uh, financial market want certainty. And what now appears to be 
a, 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 a likelihood that government, government may shut down uh, because of the debt limit controversy at the Federal level, uh, then, you know, that causes problem for us. Mr. Fabian. Mr. Oh. Fabian, I hate to cut you off. Uh, we're, we, we ran through the red light by about a minute, so uh, we, we may have time to come back to uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, but at this point I would like to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. I, McHenry. I thank the Chairman, and um, thank you for your testimony. And, uh, read your test, you know, taking a look at your testimony and um, obviously interested in this issue. I, I have a subcommittee, I chair a subcommittee, uh, which Chairman Gowdy is also on, and we have been looking at State and Municipal uh, credit worthiness. Uh, it is a very interesting issue in light of unfunded pension liabilities. Now, uh, Dr. Rivlin, I, you, I know you have a unique experience here, but in the 90s, um, there was uh, basically the Federal Government did bail out uh, D.C.'s pension liabilities. And then uh, D.C. has since switched to a defined contribution pension plan. Um, has that been uh, successful? Has it provided stability financially for the district and its taxpayers? Uh, yes, it has. Um the district uh, pension liability uh, was very large. Uh, I have forgotten the numbers now. But it had been accumulated while the Congress ran the district. It was pre-home rule uh, liability. So uh, those of us in the district didn't think of it as a bailout. We thought of it as the Federal Government facing up to the liabilities that it had uh, created. Uh, fortunately, it did. Uh, and the uh, district was able to uh, essentially st go forward uh, with a better constructed uh, pension plan. Yes. Uh, well, Dr. Rivlin, it, it, you, know, you, you certainly have a unique perspective, uh, and you have certainly put forward some interesting ideas on entitlement reforms writ large, and we appreciate your service to your government. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, it, Mr. Fabian, in terms of uh, a municipality, a state, or the district's uh, credit profile. Uh, does that defined contribution versus defined uh, benefit uh, pension liability or pension fund, does that have a bearing on their credit profile? Um, the, the existence of one versus the other um, are, are really is inconsequential. It is just about the, the, the annual burden, um, you know, how they fund up their, you know, the, the yeah. employer contribution um, and how they manage the long-term liabilities. So it is, so, I mean, the fact that it has switched to, to defined contribution, it doesn't really impact the credit quality. But just let me say that going forward over the next, you know, in the last year and over the next few years, uh, pension liabilities will become um, a larger factor in, um, for the rating agencies, so, th so they will tend to bring ratings down. The fact that the district doesn't have that means that the district's rating will not be subject to those same pressures. Okay. So, so net positive going forward that they have a defined contribution rather than defined benefit plan. Well, that they do. Well, that they're yeah. In terms of yes, credit, yes, yes. credit ratings, yes, sir. And uh, in terms of the accounting of those pension liabilities, I mean, basically, what you're saying is, if you have a well-funded, well-capitalized pension plan, you don't really make a judgment about the contents of it. You just simply judge whether or not it's um, appropriately funded, right? That's right. That's okay. Right. So, um, but the the accounting of these pension uh, funds. Do you have some concerns about how uh, uh, states, municipalities and the district uh, account for, I am sorry, not the district, but larger than this, but uh, the accounting of these uh, defined benefit pension plans? Um, well, you know, for sure, uh, you, know, it, you, know, it, you know, there has been uh, or there have been accounting issues in the past. Um, I think that the the efforts of the GASB um, um, to uh, reconcile that and to begin to organize it um, um, are definitely a positive. Uh, the the uh, Nunes uh, Issa Orion bill, uh, I think, which would uh, require a more uniform accounting of those pension liabilities, is is from an analyst from a credit analyst perspective, is maybe a step in the right direction. Very good. Um, although there are, you know, limits on, you, you know, looking at limiting the, the state's access to the tax exempt markets, you know, is also very difficult to say. I, I think that, you know, it needs to be carefully drawn, you know, encouraging those or requiring those conditions, um, but at the same time, not not necessarily limiting access to the capital markets. All right, uh, Dr. Gandhi, if you, you know, can you comment on uh, your view in terms of your role 
uh, on uh, whether or not this defined contribution uh, pension plan has been helpful uh, in terms of, of your role in making sure that the district is uh, fiscally solvent? Well, uh, the fisc district is fiscally solvent. Whether we want to have a defined benefit or defined contribution plan, it is a policy decision of the mayor and the council. My obligation here is to make sure that whichever plan they suggest and, 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 and determine uh, to be appropriate for district, that plan must be properly, actuarially funded. And as I pointed out earlier, our plan is actuarially fully funded. And I think we may be among the very, very few jurisdictions in the country to claim that. And as Mr. Fabian pointed out, it suggests uh, great credit strength on our part. Thank you. And thank you for your service to our government. I thank the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina, and I would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, again, as I have uh, listened to the testimony, I am convinced that, Dr. Roblin, I am convinced that the District of Columbia could teach the Congress some things. I find it interesting that we bring the District in, of Columbia here and looking at their budgetary situation, uh, one which has been addressed in a very responsible way, as I said, combined with compassion and keeping people well, making sure kids are educated. Uh, there are cities and states that could, and this Congress that could take a few pointers. But I want to just ask you, Dr. Gandhi, and then I'm going to yield, Mr. Chairman, to, to my colleague, Ms. Norton, Holmes Norton. You know, the one thing I, 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 that, that the district has that I wish we had in Baltimore is that you've got property. And by the way, congratulations on your great work. Thank you. You've got property values that are going up. Yes, sir. Which is phenomenal. I mean, that, to me, is major. You've got, I mean, has there been sort of a, like a rediscovery of the district? I mean, in other words, it seems like uh, everybody wants to now live in the district. And I remember when I was a student at Howard University a long time ago, back in 1969, I remember I used to see all these vacant houses. And I used to say to myself as a student, it would seem as if every square inch of the District of Columbia would be invaluable because it literally is the capital of the world. And it seems like people are discovering that. And I'm just wondering, how does that help with your stability, with your tax base, and help you to collect that $5 billion plus that the mayor talked about? Uh, uh, your assessment is entirely correct, sir. The district presently is perhaps the most sought after commercial real property market in the country, if not in the world. The last two major investments that have happened in just the last two months, one in the city center, $700 million development, the money came from Middle East. Uh, $500 million uh, investment in uh, a convention center headquarter hotel, again, money came from the Middle East. People are flocking to the district. Uh, and the amount of the revenues that I have added, roughly $165 million uh, uh, in a gross basis, all of that basically is the real property, commercial real property. I think the image of the district of 80s and 90s is gone. What you have now is a vibrant, hip city that is culturally very diverse. Uh, it has cultural climate. It has uh, attraction in terms of the entertainment, in terms of education, in terms of governance that are truly unique. Now, did you say hip city? <laughs> Is that what you said? Yes, sir. Oh, I, thought I, I, I thought I was hearing things. No. <laughs> it is an accounting uh, term. I, I suggest, uh, all I suggest is you visit, uh, visit uh, Mount Pleasant area, uh, Gallery Place area. And, uh, 
30 years ago, when I used to be at the General Accounting Office, that area around Gallery Place, Chinatown, you know, was really not a safe area in the evening. Today, you would see thousands of people every evening. I know. I see it. I go to the movies down there. That's, uh, that's <laughs> our Times Square, sir. That yes. is our Times Square. Mm. And wait till another few years, and you would see the area around the stadium. It's going to be uh, a very attractive area. Today, a city has more theater per person than any other city in the country. We have world-class Shakespeare theater, Kennedy Center, Arena Stage. I mean, I can go on and on. And, and great educational institutions here. I think the city has a great future ahead, a great future ahead. And, and great credit should go to our distinguished mayors and, and council and um, community and civic leaders like Dr. Rivlin here. Uh, I think the city is, is on, uh, on, a, on a great promise here. I see Dr. Rivlin wants to say something. I'm sorry, Ms. Norton. Dr. Rivlin? I just want to add a, uh, a, a cautionary note. I agree with everything on the enthusiasm of uh, Dr. Gandhi about the city. But that very resurgence and the upward pressure on property values and rents uh, creates problems for um, a city which has a large low income population uh, and uh, creates needs in terms of affordable housing uh, that are difficult to meet. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. The chair would now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank all three of you. Dr. Gandhi, let me, how long have you been involved with the uh, financial operation? Uh, I have been the um, chief financial officer now for 10 years. And prior to that time? I was uh, uh, head of the Office of Tax and Revenue, and before that, I was with the General Accounting Office, GAO. You know, I was just, as I listened, thinking that probably yourself, Dr. Rivlin, and perhaps a uh, council member and former mayor, Marion Barry, probably know as much about the history and operation of District of Columbia finances and government as anybody alive. I mean, there would probably be nobody else alive who knows much about this as the three of you. My, my, my question is, and I have served for three terms as a member of a large city council, the city council in the city of Chicago, and I was trying to rationalize what is it that Congress provides other than money <laughs> in terms of the oversight for resources? And, of course, we used to get an awful lot of Federal money from we don't get nearly as much anymore, but there was a time. And, uh, the oversight was of the money, but then, of course, Congress did not approve our budget. So what is it that Congress provides that the District of Columbia could not provide for itself? other than the money, which is very, the direct money is very, very small, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi has pointed out. Um, it is hard to think of much of anything. I, I would like to commend the Congress, actually, for having moved over the last few years uh, away from micromanaging uh, the uh, district and trying to play uh, city council. Uh, 
Uh, I have sat with uh, uh, Delegate Norton in uh, Mr. Ishtuk's office, and I couldn't believe it. I thought we were just sitting here talking about st street repairs and, and potholes. And I thought, what is the Congressman doing wasting his time talking about this? Uh, fortunately, that era has uh, is passed, uh, and we have not had uh, much interference except on some major social issues like the needle exchange or abortion. Last question. I find intriguing the proposal that the chairman of the committee has put forth separating or having essentially two budgets. I, I mean, while it is possible, but do you see where it would pose any challenges or uh, any difficulties in the budgeting process? I do not think so, because primarily what we are asking for is managing our own local dollars, and that Congress would let us do that. It would facilitate a great deal of our management of the city, of our school system, and would not create any problems for us. The Federal appropriation can take its own course, as it usually does. So I would wholeheartedly support, uh, you know, Ms. Norton's uh, idea of a budget autonomy uh, that would give us flexibility to manage our own resources. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the uh, the distinguished gentleman. Uh, I have just been informed that the uh, judiciary is calling for a recorded vote and. Um, one of my goals is to not miss those if I can avoid it. Uh, but on behalf of all of us, uh, I, I want to thank the three witnesses, uh, not just for your expertise and your acumen, but also for your professionalism and the civility with which you uh, treat one another and the, and the members of, of this panel. And uh, if you will excuse my poor manners, I would like to come thank you in person. Uh, but judiciary uh, is calling. So, Dr. Gandhi, I look forward to seeing you uh, soon. Mr. Fabian, uh, Dr. Rivlin, uh, my colleague and friend Paul Ryan has extraordinarily kind things to say about you, and I would look forward to the chance to talk to you in person sometime, too. Uh, with that, uh, the uh, committee is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership and interest.